This week on Christian World News, 70 years of repression as the People's Republic of China celebrates its anniversary. We remember the millions who suffered under the communist regime. Plus, moment of grace, this man forgave his brother's killer. You won't believe what happened next. And Israel celebrates its high holy days. What do they mean for Christians? How understanding the Jewish holidays can strengthen your faith. Welcome to Christian World News, everyone. I'm Wendy Griffith. George Thomas is on assignment. As China marked its 70th anniversary in opulent fashion, democratic protests were being crushed in Hong Kong. Tens of millions have died under Chinese communism. So was the 70th anniversary really a reason to celebrate? CBN senior international correspondent Dale Hurd shows us the images from Beijing. It was pomp and grandeur befitting a world empire. But for the countless millions who have suffered under Chinese communism, this was not a happy day. As banners flew and parades marched in Beijing, police in Hong Kong were shooting a pro-democracy protester in the chest in one of Hong Kong's most violent days. And when President Trump tweeted, congratulations to President Xi and the Chinese people on the 70th anniversary of the People's Republic of China, he got slammed by other Republicans and followers on Twitter. Representative Liz Cheney tweeted, the 70th anniversary of the People's Republic of China is not a day for celebration. Arkansas Senator Tom Cotton said, it's been a ghoulish 70 years of Chinese Communist Party control. The 70th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China is not something that I think we should feel the least bit uh, congratulatory about. I, as I say, I think it was uh, a very, very bad day for the world, and uh, what's flowed from it ever since has uh, borne that out. As many as 45 million Chinese died under Mao's Great Leap Forward. And in a brutal crackdown on Christians, China has been bulldozing churches and ripping down crosses. There was one pastor's wife in Henan province in 2016 who stood in front of a bulldozer as it was bulldozing a church. She wouldn't move and she actually got bulldozed. She was killed, buried alive by the Chinese Communist Party. Chinese President Xi said in his speech, there is no force that can shake this great nation. And he made every effort in Tuesday's celebration to show that he means it. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Thanks, Dale. Christians are playing a big role in Hong Kong's pro-democracy movement. Joshua Wong is one of the leaders and a committed believer. He recently testified before the U.S. Congress in support of a Hong Kong human rights bill. When the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act has already passed both in the Senate and the House uh, committee level, I think with such progress, it will just encourage Hong Kong people to be aware that how international communities stand with Hong Kong. There are, uh, in the midst of the danger and chaos, a group of Christians have come out to the four walls of the church to minister to young. There's a spirit of sacrifice. They, they... They have the, they, they come from their love. They don't want the children get hurt. Most of them got the love. They know what God doing, what church have been done. They love church more. I think I see the God hand, a big love hand. And uh, now Faith McDonald is Director of Religious Liberty Programs for the Institute on Religion and Democracy. She joins us to talk about the church in China. Faith, thanks for being with us. Oh, you're very welcome, Wendy. Thank you. Well, tell us, how bad is it, Faith, for Christians in China right now? The, the conditions for Christians in China have been getting worse and worse um, while the church has been growing. I mean, we have um, evidence that the church continues to grow in spite of the persecution, but President Xi Jinping has done a huge crackdown on Christians and on other groups um, like the Falun Gong and um, the, the Tibetan Buddhists, people like that, but especially the Christians because of their uh, willingness to, to admit that there's a higher power, a higher power than Xi Jinping. 
How different is this from the past? Because it seemed like for a while, things were actually getting better for Christians in China. It did. I would hear the narrative that, well, it depends what part of China you're in, and it's mostly the regional government that, you know, controls whether Christians are being persecuted, whether churches are being bulldozed. And for a while, it seemed like things were getting a little better, um, at least in some parts of China. But when you've got Xi Jinping himself saying, no, this is, we're, we're getting rid of China. We're on our way to making China the major superpower of the world. Um, there's no room for Christians. And uh, the Christian churches are being bulldozed. Christians are being put in prison more and more. Um, they, the Ten Commandments are being taken off of churches, especially the official three self-churches. But um, the, uh, the the underground, so-called underground churches, which had started to really come out from underground during that period where it was a little bit more free. But now um, I think, you know, the church is going to stay as a as a um, unregistered church, but going to grow and grow and grow. So uh, what can the U.S. be doing to help? Um, I mean, we're always talking about religious freedom here. President Trump has been you know, very good about that. What can we do to help China? Well, President Trump has been very good speaking about religious freedom around the world, and he also seems to be understanding that China is a threat to the United States um, more than past administrations have done, that we thought, you know, engagement with China in business was going to help. But China is, as I said before, trying to become the superpower of the world. Uh, so President uh, Trump needs to really work on both those issues to see that religious freedom is linked to our national security and really do things that will help to not only help the Christians in China, but to stop China from its uh, hegemony over the world. Um, also, I love what Joshua Wong said, that the Hong Kong human rights bill in, in Congress should go forward, encourage the people of Hong Kong, because they're just amazing the way they have continued to, to protest in spite of violence against them and how they have been so uh, dignified and gentle. Um, and, you know, compare that to Antifa in this country. Um, and you see what... Uh, what real people who want patriotism and democracy and freedom um, are doing. You know, the persecution, though, it hasn't really stopped um, the, the house church movement, has it, in China? No, it has not. And, you know, we, we hear the, the, the saying that persecution makes the church grow, as uh, uh, Bishop Tertullian said, that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. But that does not mean that Western Christians who have freedom should sit back and say, oh, well, you know, that's a blessing. Um, we should be doing everything we can to support our Christian brothers and sisters in China and throughout the persecuted church, but particularly now in China— and uh, do what we can to encourage our government to put some more pressure, more and more pressure on China, even if it means, you know, we, we have to suffer a little bit financially because of um, the sanctions that are put on China's business. And we should also make sure that our capital markets, our, our, you know, our stock is not connected to China, regardless of if it means a little bit of financial problems for us. Faith, and one last question. Leaders of Hong Kong's pro-democracy movement, I'm told, are Christians. Why is that, and how are they influencing the movement? Oh, wow. Well, I wrote an article for IRD's JuicyEcumenism.com about the fact that years ago, a British missionary came to Hong Kong and uh, worked with the triad gangs, the heroin addicts, and prostitutes, Jackie Pullinger. And Hong Kong was changed because of that. That started in the walled city in Kowloon, which was a horrible place. And God's spirit has been active in Hong Kong, you know, before that, but especially since that time. Um, we just did a letter that's also on JuicyEcumenism.com that was signed by uh, my Archbishop, Foley Beach of the Anglican Church in North America, Eric Metaxas and others, um, encouraging the Hong Kong Christians. And we even did a, our own little rendition of Sing Alleluia to the Lord to let them know that we are with them.
Fascinating. Thanks so much, Faith. It's been great talking to you. Faith McDonald, uh, we appreciate your insights. God bless God you. God bless Hong Kong. Yes. Well, coming up, Amazing Grace, see the moment a murder victim's brother forgives the killer and the stunning scene that happened next. Here in America, a jury sentenced a white Dallas police officer to 10 years in prison Wednesday after she was convicted of shooting and killing her black neighbor. It's a case that provoked protests and put further strain on the country's unhealed racial wounds. As Mark Martin shows us, the sentence also produced a powerful moment of forgiveness. This panic-filled scene in September of last year after former Dallas police officer Amber Geiger shot and killed an innocent man, Botham Jean, in his own apartment resulted in this sentence. 10 years imprisonment in the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. Geiger said she thought she had walked into her own apartment. CBN reporter Amber Strong reported on the tragedy and the response by Jean's church. I've interviewed his friends, his ministers, I talked to his teachers, I talked to his uh, employers, and it was all a consistent message that Botham John was a servant, that he was kind from the least to the greatest. The 10-year sentence with the possibility of parole after five is far less than the 99 years in prison Geiger faced. Outside the courthouse, the sentence sparked protests and intense confrontations. And Jean's mother spoke out against the police. If Amber Geiger was trained not to shoot in the heart, right, right. my son would be standing here today. But inside the courtroom, both of Jean's brother, 18 year old Brant Jean, showed tremendous forgiveness toward Geiger after the sentence was imposed. I forgive you. And. I know if you go to God and ask him, he will forgive you. I want the best for you because I know that's what, that's exactly what both of them would want you to do. And the best would be give your life to Christ. Then an amazing show of grace that attorneys, court employees and reporters said they'd never seen in all their years. I don't know if this is possible, but can, can I give her a hug, please? Please? Yes. After Brant Jean hugged the sobbing former officer, another remarkable show of love, State District Judge Tammy Kemp gave Geiger a Bible and directed her to read John 316 and even hugged her as well. The district attorney said Brant Jean's act was an amazing act of healing and forgiveness that should guide the community going forward. Mark Martin, CBN News. Thanks, Mark. Dr. Corne Becker is dean of the School of Divinity at Regent University and is with us now to talk about this incredible moment. And you were affected just now again watching it, and I'm sure you've seen it many times before. I, have, yes. I mean, it's gone viral. It's all over the Internet. Do you think God is speaking to us as a nation, and what is he saying? I think there are two things that, that we need to take away from this. First and foremost, I want to speak about the corrective system. Mm. Uh, when folks are incarcerated, um, we should get to the place where, where these systems are redemptive and that there's always a possibility of, of redemption and healing and grace that is, that is manifested. And, and certainly this was true in this particular case. Mm. But secondly, I think this young man showed an extraordinary um, example of moral courage and yeah. what true holiness looks like. Mm. Ultimately, unforgiveness holds us back. And as a country, I think there's a prophetic moment that happened here to tell us that this indeed is the way forward. Watching her run to embrace him, that's the moment that really gets me. Some have described that moment like the prodigal son. Exactly, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, very much so. And I'm so deeply taken, of course, that beautiful story in Luke's narrative where Jesus tells the story of a young man that lost his way and wasted all of his money in prodigal living and how the father waited. Yeah. And remember, he came back and said, make me a servant. And yes, the father said, no, I will accept you as a son. What do you make of the judge bringing her Bible over 
reading John 3.16 and also giving her a hug. It was just as moving, I think, as this young man's example. And again, for, for me, the judicial system should really focus on rehabilitation and grace. You know, when I think, Wendy, of all the people that are in prison right now, populations, large populations of missed opportunity. We as Christians, we as the church should really focus on that population and see if there are ways that we can redeem them and bring them back. You know, and really, I know until this moment, I wasn't even focusing on the fact, okay, the judge is, is African-American, um, the brother African-American. I was looking, you know, I didn't even see that. It was cr two Christians that came to help exactly. this suffering exactly. person and also guilty person. I mean, let's, right. be, let's be fair about that. But the Freedom From Religion Foundation has filed a complaint against the judge saying what she did is unconstitutional. What are your thoughts on that? I think it's an absolutely ridiculous statement. This is somebody right after the, she has finished her work as a judge that stepped forward as a human being and said, there is, there is a way forward for you. You know, I think you just made your case if you were an attorney, you know, saying, yes, she had just stepped down from, this, exactly. from the judge seat. Well, there is anger, of course, that her sentence, um, 10 years for murder, some people say that's a small price to pay. Was it too light, um, in your opinion? When I looked at it originally, I was stunned that it was such a short serve, uh, sentence, yes. ultimately. Because if you think about it, a young man lost his life, an innocent man. Uh, but again, I was not in the court. I did not hear all the, all the descriptions of what exactly went down. Uh, but it seems a little short to me. Yeah, I agree. Well, I think this, um, what we're going to remember about this is not the sentence, <laughs> but about this incredible act right. of... Uh, forgiveness and kindness that we saw. And Wendy, I think it's important to separate those two things. Uh, the, the prophetic example of this young man is really what should stand out. We should separate it from the sentence that was given. And again, I think this young man, he reminds me of a young Nelson Mandela hmm. that, you know, in my own home country at some point stood up and said, we have to forgive in order for us to move forward. Hmm. And, and I pray that Americans are really paying attention. Wow, that's interesting. I forgot that's right. You're from South Africa. Dr. Cornet Becker, we always appreciate your insights. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. Well, coming up, we take you to Israel for the High Holy Days and hear why Christians are taking part. More chaos in Israel's elections. Neither side can form a government and they can't agree to work together. Emily Jones has that story and more from Jerusalem. Thanks, Wendy. Welcome to Jerusalem for this Inside Israel report, where we tell you what's happening in Israel and the Middle East. Israel is in a political deadlock this week after Blue and White Party leader Benny Gantz and Benjamin Netanyahu failed to meet and form a unity government. Blue and White called off a scheduled meeting and accused Likud of acting in bad faith. But Likud says Blue and White is sabotaging the negotiation process. Netanyahu has just days to form a government, and he is scrambling behind the scenes to meet the deadline. The order of the moment is a unity government, a broad national unity government that is formed quickly. If Netanyahu fails to form a government, Israel will be one step closer to a possible third election. Jews in Israel and around the world are preparing their hearts and minds for Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. On Yom Kippur, Jews pray the Vidui, a prayer of repentance on behalf of themselves and the entire Jewish people. Reverend David Pelegi, who serves as the rector of Christ Church in Jerusalem, believes Christians also have something to learn from this Jewish holy day. One thing that we, we learn from the Jewish people, uh, something quite important, especially about Yom Kippur, that it's not enough to say you're sorry. You have to confess, say you're sorry, and then at the same time take practical steps to change your behavior. It's a teaching of Jesus, and it's also something that's part and parcel of, uh, of Jewish tradition. Yom Kippur is a solemn day of prayer and fasting and is the holiest day on the Jewish calendar. If you've ever been to Jerusalem, you may have placed a handwritten prayer slip between the stones of the Western Wall. But have you ever wondered where they go when those cracks get too full? Well, twice a year, workers remove the old prayer slips, bundle them up in bags, and bury them in the cemetery on the Mount of Olives. They use only their bare hands or wooden sticks to remove the notes because the Bible says no tools of iron are allowed in the temple. 
No one reads the slips because they're only meant for God. Of course we pray. We ask from the Creator of the world that He hears their requests, that He hears their prayers, and fulfill all the yearnings of their hearts for good. These prayer slips are treated with extreme care because it is forbidden to destroy anything with the name of God written on it. You can see more stories just like these on our Jerusalem Dateline program. Well, that's it for Inside Israel this week. Wendy, back to you. It's Emily, and you can learn more about the significance of the Jewish holidays and see how CBN celebrates them every year. Find it all on our website, cbnnews.com. We'll be right back. Finally this week, an Indian girl hopes and prays for her mischievous brother to change his ways. But nothing seemed to work until God spoke to his heart through CBN's Superbook. Take a look. Spandana loves her little brother, Ajay, but sometimes he can be a little hard to handle. He's very mischievous. He starts fights, so his teachers complain to me. He gets punished at school and at home. Then I feel bad and cry because he is in trouble again. Spandana wanted to help her brother but didn't know how. Then at school, she started watching Superbook. Superbook yeah. In Superbook, I watched the test. Abraham prayed and relied on God. After that, I began praying to Jesus. I've been praying since then that my brother would do well in school and stop getting into so much trouble. Spandana says her prayers were answered when Ajay got a good grade on his next test. I prayed for my brother to get an A or B. When my family went for his parent-teacher meeting, teacher said, my brother got a B. We don't fight much anymore. And he doesn't get in trouble at home or at school. Spandana says Jesus can answer any of her prayers. When I watched Superbook, I learned so much about Jesus. Thank you, CBN, for showing me Superbook. What a precious little girl. She loved her brother so much. She had to pray that he would do better, and he did. Well, thanks so much for joining us this week on Christian World News. Until then, from all of us here, goodbye, and God bless you.